What's good, Josh Boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out 10 times WWE rewrote their own history. They tend to do this <laughs> uh, frequently. They'll, you know, at some point they'll just rewrite things and you'd be like, wait a minute, what happened? I remember that, that that didn't happen that way. Why is this happening? It's, they, that's, it's just WWE. <laughs> they'll implement something or say something and then years later they'll forget that they said something or something happened and then they'll just We'll just pretend it never happened or they'll rewrite it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, like this draft thing, I don't know how long these draft situations, like certain stars saying on one show and other stars saying on one show, I don't know how effective that's going to be because we've tried this uh, before and for a little bit, it, they stayed true to it and then people just started going to different brands willy-nilly and we didn't know why. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, if that uh, if that's the case this time around, but I appreciate all the love and support you guys have shown on the channel We're gonna be checking out a video from Cultaholic Wrestling. If you haven't checked uh, subscribe to them go subscribe to them uh, Give them a subscription and check out uh, some of their content right, Provides let's get right a to this retcon one. or a full-on rewrite world wrestling entertainment have not been shy about meddling with their own history mm -hmm. There are various reasons for this from saving face and avoiding legal issues to exaggerating accomplishments and progressing storylines, uh -huh. but it can be pretty maddening for long-time fans who witness something happen one way just for it to be retold through WWE's own filter. When looking for the WWE history book, perhaps you should check the fiction section first. <laughs> I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, Thanks. and these are 10 times WWE rewrote their own history. They, they stay us. doing it, and they probably will. <laughs> Number 10, Getting the F Out. On May 6th, 2002, WWE officially changed its name from the World Wrestling Federation to World Wrestling Entertainment. Fans were well prepped for the switch of initials thanks to an effectively amusing ad campaign about the company getting the F out. Now, Vince McMahon would have you believe that the decision to switch from WWF to WWE was about emphasizing the entertainment aspect of his brand of sports entertainment while moving further away from that disgusting pro wrestling nonsense. In truth, WWE fought the change necessitated after WWE breached an agreement with UK-based conservation group the World Wildlife Fund every single step of the way. Mm -hmm. The Panda people laid the smackdown on Vince's legal team in court, resulting in WWE being unable to use the Scratch logo that debuted in 1998, yep. as well as the WWF letters in specified circumstances. WWE attempted to spin the ruling in their favor with a frankly laughable press release, but anyone who had actually followed the saga knew that WWE were simply in the wrong and paid for their mistakes. Yeah. Number 9, Kane's Burns. From the get-go, it was stressful. It's crazy, man. It, it, some people say that's when WWE or WWE kind of died. Some people like, oh, once it, it turned into WWE, that's when it died. And I was like, I, I don't know about that. People were still into it. There was still some stuff that was worth watching and checking out around that time, so I'm not going to say that. By WWE that Kane wore a mask to hide the burns he sustained to his face in a fire that The Undertaker yep. had set in an attempt to burn down the family funeral home and murder his younger sibling. Yeah. Brothers, eh? This really added to the Big Red Machine's aura and also made fans want to see just how disfigured the ugly freak was under the hood. We got the occasional inconclusive glimpse before Kane lost a World Heavyweight Title versus Mask match against Triple H on the June 23rd, 2003 episode of Raw. Yeah. And then we got a load of smudged mascara and a skullet. Yeah. So what happened here then? Well, it's entirely possible that WWE didn't think ahead, shocking I know, and plan mm -hmm. for the possibility of Kane taking his mask off when they penned his elaborate backstory. And that was the thing. I'm pretty sure they didn't really think he was going to be taking his mask off at any point. But it's like, if you're going to go with that, he got burned. Like, like he was disfigured. You kind of got to stay with that, <laughs> but they didn't, so. <laughs> Scrambling for an explanation of the absence of scarred flesh, it was instead claimed that the burns the devil's favorite demon had suffered were merely psychological. Yeah. yeah. So was it also all in DX's head when they were visibly repulsed after unmasking him backstage in 2000? Yeah. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. 
Number eight, Hogan <laughs> slamming Andre. Uh, in the main event of WrestleMania 3, WWE, the irresistible yeah. force met the immovable object when Hulk Hogan defended his WWE title against Andre the Giant. The Hulkster won the match, becoming the first person in history to both slam and pin the seven-footer. Well, at least that's how WWE tells it. The Hulkster himself will tell it that he slammed Andre as a shoot, brother, tearing every muscle in his back in the process. But that's another lie for another time. <laughs> in reality, Andre had been slammed multiple times by many different people. Wow. Harley Race, Kamala, Stan Hansen, and even Hogan himself, among others, had slammed him in the past. And you know what? Hogan previously did it on a major WWE show, no less. That's crazy now, Andre that taking a slam that. wasn't exactly a regular occurrence, and most of these happened in other territories or overseas in Japan, but they did happen. Same goes for the big man losing, even if he did have a healthy win percentage. Hog's feet at Mania 3 is impressive enough in itself, of yet course. WWE feel the need to inflate it along with the show's highly disputed attendance figure. Number seven, hmm. who's your pappy? Rey Mysterio and Eddie. They stay doing that. They stay doing the old, oh, we got 100,000 people when really it's like fucking maybe like 97,000 there. <laughs> Guerrero's feud took a personal turn in the summer of 2005 when Latino Heat revealed his big secret. Hey, we just checked out that match on Patreon. Uh, for the Patreon, actually. We checked it out last night, so I'm not sure when it's going to drop. But if you're part of the Patreon on the Inner Clutch uh, page, man, we definitely did just check out Dominic. I'm not Dominic. Uh, Ray versus Eddie, the custody uh battle ladder match at SummerSlam. So uh, I believe it's SummerSlam on five. So definitely be on the lookout for that for all the Patreon subscribers that are subscribed to the Inner Clutch Patreon. I think you guys are gonna enjoy that. And confess that he was the biological father of Ray's son Dominic. As the story went, Guerrero sired a child while he and wife Vicky were on the outs. After Eddie proved unwilling to raise the boy himself, Mysterio and his wife Angie adopted him. The soap opera twist led to a ladder match for the custody of Dominic at yeah. SummerSlam 2005, <laughs> oh, wrestling, which yep. was won by Ray. He may have won custody, but according to the storyline, Dominic was Eddie's biological child. Yeah. Fast forward 15 years, Dom decides to get into the business himself and is paired with his actual biological father. WWE dropped the pretense that Dominic was a Guerrero by blood while yeah. playfully referencing and poking fun at his previous kayfabe lineage. Yeah. WWE obviously couldn't perpetuate the falsehood following Eddie's passing and weren't going to meddle with a proper father-son team when Dominic stepped into the ring, but it's funny how such a major plot point has been disregarded. <laughs> of course, Number bro, six, they had to. It's, I, it's funny, they... they yeah. <laughs> They, they legit went with that route. That's the funny thing. Oldberg's run-in. Speaking of Eddie, how about that time he beats Brock Lesnar in the main event of No Way Out 2004 to win the WWE title? What a moment it was when Latino Heat countered the F5 with a DDT onto the title belt and hit the frog splash for a feel-good three counts. All that after battling the beast for 30 minutes with no help whatsoever. <laughs> well, that is apart from the timely assist provided by Goldberg after mm -hmm. the referee was bumped. But let's not bring that little wrinkle up, shall we? Yes, even though WWE sneakily omit that part when celebrating Guerrero's title triumph, it yeah. did happen. The man had shown up earlier in the night and attacked the next big thing prior to being removed from the arena by security. He must have managed to break free and sneak back in because he came back later to spear Lesnar while Brian Hebner was taking a nap. Mm -hmm. To be fair, it was only a false finish and didn't lead directly to the finish itself, but it's pretty amusing how WWE scrubs it from the match's recap. I will say this, the pop he got when he won was incredible, bro. Number five, the Monday Night War. I mean, where do we even start with this one? They say history is written by the victors, and you don't have to convince me twice after seeing how WWE likes to tell the tale of the Monday Night War. If you listen to WWE's version of their mid to late 90s feud with WCW, you will hear of how Ted Turner bought all of the McMahon-made stars due to his limitless checkbook, how WCW played dirty by doing heinous things like revealing the results of WWE's pre-taped shows live on air, and how D-Generation X turned the tide by invading WCW with a tank. 
Honestly, the picture WWE paints is so distorted and one-sided, yeah. <laughs> it is beyond ridiculous. <laughs> they do so try to paint themselves as the the good guys in Bishop and WCW. They were the devils. They were the bad guys, the enemies. I don't think it was all the way like that. <laughs> bad, but their version of the so-called war is considered legit by many fans who only really know of it because of WWE produced media. Uh -huh. To them, the valiant mum and pop promotion managed to overcome the evil corporation due to their creativity, determination, superior storytelling, and homegrown stars. The reality is, of course, far, far different. Yeah. Number four, Jamaican Me Crazy. Oh, when no. Kofi Kingston burst onto the scene in 2008, much was made of his Jamaican heritage. Yeah. Pre-debut vignettes showed him on the beaches of his homeland, he had reggae-inflected entrance yeah. music, wore Jamaican flag colours on his gear, and, oh yeah, he was called Kofi Kingston, Kingston and spoke with a heavy Jamaican <laughs> accent. At some point, shortly before Bragging Rights 2009, funny. Kofi simply dropped the accent and started being billed from his real home country of Ghana, West Africa. Naturally, that cheeky DX chappy Triple H couldn't just let it slide and called nope. Kingston out about his disappearing accent. He said, wait, weren't you Jamaican? <laughs> that shit was funny. I was like, wait a minute, he was Jamaican, what the fuck? During a promo. And that was that, to be honest. Yeah. No explanation or reasoning for the change, just a wink and a nod and a friendly crotch chop and time to move on. Yep. <laughs> and that was for the best, really, since the New Day member only did the Jamaican thing on the indies because Prince Nana was doing a Ghanaian Prince gimmick in Ring of Honor and he didn't want to be accused of trying to copy him. Oh. I mean, the accent may be gone, but I wish those bumper clarts would bring back that banging SOS theme. Hey, yeah, no, I, I, it was funny. I was just thinking that his theme was actually pretty SOS. That's that shit used to jam, man. I ain't gonna lie to you. <laughs> oh, man. Young Kofi, man. Three, Benoit. Oh, right, so yeah. we go from something relatively light and playful to this. Yeah. Look, you cannot talk about WWE history without talking about Chris Benoit. Yep. The Rabid Wolverine was a major part of it between 2000 and 2007, though WWE have went to great lengths to erase him from their history yep. ever since the Benoit family tragedy. Faced with an unprecedented situation, the company decided to refrain from mentioning Benoit's name yeah. going forward. His name still appears in the history books, but Chris Benoit isn't searchable on the network and mm -hmm. his name and likeness doesn't appear on WWE programming wherever possible. Yeah. So when the Radicals jumping from WCW to WWE gets brought up, it's Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko and Perry Saturn who are shown. When WrestleMania 20 is discussed, the big matches were Eddie's WWE title victory over Kurt Angle and The Undertaker's return against Kane, and not the Canadian Crippler's World Heavyweight title win yeah. in the main event. Some may argue that Benoit's career shouldn't be overlooked, but given the circumstances, WWE really had no choice but to take the position they have in distancing themselves from him. Number I mean, two. I mean, people <laughs> lost their lives. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know some people want to make that argument. Oh, we got to separate the man from the wrestler, like the man from his in-ring wrestling performance. No, I'm sorry. This is one of those things you can't. I know some people do it. Some people pick and choose. They separate the artist from, you know, the music from the actual person. We see it all the time. But this is a situation where people, innocent people, their lives were taken. It, it would be a disservice to them if they just sit up there and let's talk about Benoit's championship runs and his amazing matches. Yeah, we know about them, but it doesn't need to be brought up, honestly. And it's not something that you want to, you know, kind of just, you know, remember. You know what I'm saying? Like, in the sense of, like, oh, yeah, this guy was a fantastic wrestler. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what he did in the ring. Because what he did outside of the ring impacted, you know, some people's lives. And, you know, he took some people, he took his own family, some of his family members' lives. They didn't have a say-so in that. So it's just one of those things where it's like, it's a very tough line. It Dude was fantastic in the ring. But what he did afterwards, you know, what he did was inexcusable. And you kind of have to throw away all the good that he did. Not throw away, but in a sense... You kind of don't want to bring it up. And, of course, they have sponsors. 
They what they sponsors were like, wait a minute, you're you're showing clips from a guy that killed his family members, some of his family members, and then killed himself. What are we, we you're showing that? You're you you're giving him some praise? Like, no, what are you doing? So I get it. I understand both sides of the coin here. But at the end of the day, man, it it's you gotta ask yourself, if someone murdered your family members, even though they were a fantastic athlete or whatever. Would you want people to still, you know, you know, you want people to glorify what they did out, you know, outside of that situation? Or would you want people to just kind of like, you know, not show any glorification to all of it? You know what I'm saying? So you got to ask yourself those questions. You were reeking of dishonesty. And now back to levity with the curious case of Edge and Christian. Were they supposed to be best friends? Were they supposed to be brothers? Do you even think you know them? <laughs> Something certainly reeks here, and it ain't of awesomeness. From Christian's WWE debut, it was said that he and his fellow brood member were legit siblings, something mm -hmm. that was continually parroted over the course I ain't gonna lie to you. I, when I was younger, I thought they were actually brothers. <laughs> was for the next many years. There were even some humorous skits where Captain Charisma was ghosted by their grandma Edna, which was one of the reasons Christian ended up turning on the Rated R Superstar mm -hmm. in 2001. Fast forward to the 2010 draft and Christian is giving an emotional speech, talking about how close the two were and how he remembers their first meeting in sixth grade and hold the fort. <laughs> Just like that, Edge and Christian were no longer battling brothers, but yep. best buds. And that's the actual truth of the matter, of mm -hmm. course, as Jay Rezo and Adam Copeland are not related by blood, but bonded by friendship and spandex and baby oil and all that good stuff. Hey, yo. <laughs> Number one, revising the warrior. In 2005, WWE released a hatchet job DVD called The Self-Destruction of the Ultimate Warrior. In it, the former WWE champion was roundly criticized and mocked by his former colleagues, then current stars, and even Vince McMahon himself. Damn. Jim Helwig was on the outs with the company at the time and wasn't exactly making any friends with his outrageous hate-filled actions and statements like oh, wow. cheering on Bobby Heenan's cancer diagnosis. Whoa. Warrior would continue damn. to be at odds with WWE until fences were finally mended in 2014. Mm -hmm. When Helwig died just days after being inducted into the WWE, we Hall of Fame, the company quickly went to work in lionizing the face-painted superstar, including greenlighting a new, much more flattering documentary and mm -hmm. establishing the Warrior Award in his honor. In this new documentary, released just nine days after his passing, the Ultimate Warrior was portrayed as being a transcendent icon of the industry yeah. who had been perhaps misunderstood by his peers. The self-destruction DVD, as well as the resultant litigation, was briefly covered in the piece, but WWE swiftly buried the animosity and returned to a more positive tone. I mean, I'm all for letting bygones be bygones, but the total 180 performed yeah. here was as jarring as an Ultimate Warrior promo. And that's just one of those things where it's like now, before he died, they were on much better terms. So then when he died, now it's all... Oh, he was this, he was this, he was this. They literally released a documentary clowning him. You know what I'm saying? And some may say it's justifiable at the time, you know, for what his action was. But then when he dies, oh, he was this, he was this, he was so amazing. You know, and that's just how it goes a lot of times. People will sit up there, you know, you may have beefs with someone. If you're able to rectify those beefs, people will overlook the bad things and really glorify just the positive things. And some since we're talking about this, I know we just got off the Benoit situation. I want to expound on that just a little bit more. And I may make a video about that, giving my whole thoughts and opinions on that. So if y'all want me to, let me know down below. But just to that point, how they made amends. You know what I'm saying? WWE and Ultimate Warrior, they made amends. So now everything is, you know, all right, you know, wasn't that bad of a guy. Chris Benoit, he wasn't able to make amends. Granted, this is a way different story on killing someone, you know, that's, or, you know, taking someone's life. That's way heavier, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, it's, it's one of those things where at the end of the day, we're, we're supposed to forgive and I'm not saying people can't forgive Chris Benoit for what he did, but you can't forget. And that's what tarnishes his legacy. And that goes for anybody. You know what I'm saying? I'm a big fan of Michael Jordan. You, you see the Jordans behind me. He, he's my greatest player to ever play basketball of all time. He's my GOAT. You know what I'm saying? I put him at number one above everybody else. But 
if it came out and he murdered a few people or murdered just one person, that would change his legacy forever. You know what I'm saying? That would change his legacy forever for sure. And no one's perfect. So I'm not going to sit up here and say, oh, you know what I'm saying? You can't support someone if they do one bad thing because we're all human beings. But then you have to start questioning yourself. If they murdered someone or took someone's life for no apparent reason or, you know, they're, you know, just someone didn't have a, a choice in the matter. Now it's like, I don't know if I can just be walking around wearing Jordans like that. I don't know if I can consider him the go. No matter what he's done, he took an innocent person's life. I don't, you, yeah, you can say separate that, but it's like, nah, his legacy will forever be tarnished by that. Just like if I did something very heinous, I wouldn't expect y'all to be like, oh, well, Ross was really a good person before then. We should still support his videos. No, if I did something evil and heinous, and I know I did something evil and heinous, I would expect y'all to be like, nah, I'm good on watching his content anymore. I'm good on checking out his old videos. I'm good on supporting whatever he had going on because what he did at the end was very messed up. He can be forgiven, but you're not going to forget certain things. So if y'all want me to talk about that Chris Benoit situation, give my real deep dive opinion on that, I definitely will because I, I think it's an interesting conversation to have. Separating the wrestler from his ending, his actions and what he's done so comment down below let me know if there's any other uh moments that wwe has conveniently rewrote <laughs> um re rewriting their history but i appreciate all love and support you guys shown on the channel road 250k i'm still young speedy youtube wrestling champion of the world appreciate y'all kicking me see y'all next one peace